I am pleased to announce today that the Government of Canada is contributing $10 million to upgrade the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. The funding will be used to build five superconducting crab cavity cryomodules. The po components of what can be described as very sophisticated deep freezers. It turns out Canadian researchers and engineers are experts at building these deep freezers. When these sophisticated deep freezers are installed at CERN, the cryomodules will cool down the components so that researchers can manipulate the subatomic particles before they smash together. To put it plainly, Canadian science will be at the heart of this global experiment to unravel the mysteries of the universe. So the High Lumi project will enable us to get a lot more out of the LHC than we've been able to get so far. It's going to enable us to probe much deeper into the history of the universe, look at very rare processes and study particle physics in much more detail than regular LHC. Two construction sites, uh, one at point 0.5 in France and one at point 0.1 in uh, Switzerland. This is the Swiss side. We're going to build five surface structures, an electrical building, then also a ventilation building, the SD building which gives access to the shaft, a building to house compressors and a cooling tower. We have a shaft to be constructed, 80 meters deep, 10 meters of diameter. We have a cavern, uh, 50 meters long and 16 meters of diameter. We are like the people that are building up the, the ship with which uh, Christophorus Columbus will discover uh, America. No ships, no new land. But I'm wondering um, what you would say about what is the, what's the source of meaning? Um, if it's, it seems that um, lots of religions have answered that question with God, um, but if there is no God, then it seems that um, humans would have to kind of artificially impose meaning on the world, mm -hmm. in which case um, all of the meaning that we reap from the world is already given to it by us, um, and there's no net meaning in the world or something like that. So I'm wondering what you would say about mm -hmm. where meaning comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, so when Nietzsche announced the death of God, which was an, something he announced actually in sorrow and trembling, I would say, rather than triumphantly, which is often how that's read because people actually don't read Nietzsche. They just read one half of a quote 
from Nietzsche. Um, his, his, his prognostication was that we would have to become creators of our own values. And then it wasn't long after that that he died. And so um, what that meant was that any further investigations into that idea by him came to an end. Now, not much later, Freud came along. And Freud demonstrated quite clearly, even though he doesn't get nearly as much credit for this as he should, that there was no evidence whatsoever that people were masters of their own houses. And that we were the playthings of the gods in, in the Greek sense, that we were driven perceptually and behaviorally, emotionally, motivationally, by forces that weren't exactly under our voluntary control, autonomous internal forces. And you could think about those as where the gods went when they depopulated the cosmos. And that was Jung's notion, right? And Jung was a very astute student of Nietzsche. He gave a seminar on the first half of Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra that's 1,600 pages long. And so that's an, in, and it's, it's actually quite a dense read as well. So it's not 1600 pages written in crayon, you know. <laughs> so, and Jung's sense was that Nietzsche's prognostication had to be wrong because human beings cannot create their own values. We actually don't have that capacity. We might be able to participate in the creation of those values, but we have to come to terms with our own nature while we're doing so. And I think the biological evidence for that is, it's absolutely overwhelming. If, if, you don't, if you don't believe that, then what that means is that either you don't know anything about biology or that you've stuck your head in the sand to the point where you're unable to see. Now, Jung was very interested in how that, those internal forces manifested themselves, but also how they organized themselves across time. Okay, so there's two answers to your question. One is that they organize themselves into a hierarchy and there's something at the top. And what he believed that what was at the top in the West was symbolized by the figure of Christ. And he thought of Christ as a symbol of the self. And the self was an emergent consequence of the internal arranging of motivational states into a hierarchy. Partly as a consequence of, of psychological activity, integration, maturation, but also par partly as a consequence of social pressure. Because how you organize yourself is partly a consequence of who you are and how you organize yourself, but it's also partly a consequence of how other people demand that you be organized. And so, and I think that Jean Piaget's work fits very nicely into that. I, I think that they were aiming in some sense at the same synthesis. All right, so with regards to, so one, 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 one place for the derivation of meaning is the consequence of that hierarchical organization of those intrinsic motivational states into something approximating a unity that can operate properly across spans of time. So the second answer to that is meaning is actually a manifestation of a very deep instinct. And it's an elaboration of something the Russian neuropsychologists, that's another answer to the question about the Russians. I was a devotee of the Russian neuropsychologists, Alexander Luria and his students, Sokolov and Vinogradova, who were arguably the three greatest neuropsychologists of the last half of the 20th century. And Vinogradova and Sokolov discovered the orienting reflex, which was probably the biggest discovery in psychophysiology in the last 50 years of the 20th century. It's an unbelievably important discovery. And this, the orienting reflex is the reflex that orients you towards what you don't understand. It's the reflex that orients you towards anomaly. And what that means is that you have a structure built into you to help you make sense of what you don't understand. It's an actual instinct. Now, when the orienting reflex grips you, that's when you're surprised by something or startled by something. That's the lowest level manifestation of the orienting reflex. And it's actually part of the mechanisms that defend you against predators. But that orienting reflex is, and, and that's very low level nervous system response. Very, very quick, very reflexive, requires very little cognitive processing, fast enough to have you jump out of the way of a striking snake. So extraordinarily quick and dirty. But like many important evolutionary adaptations, it's echoed at multiple levels of the nervous system. And so the orienting reflex is actually very complex as it unfolds across time. 
And so if something startles you, you might spend a year thinking about it, depending on how startled you were. And that entire year-long process of thinking is actually an extended manifestation of the orienting reflex. And that's a deep source of meaning. And so, so that's like a second answer to the question. answer to the question would be something like your hemispheres are specialized in a, in a, in a particular way it's a low resolution representation by the way so and 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 so one of your hemispheres is specialized to operate when you know what's going on and where what you're doing is having the results you intend you can think about that as explored territory that's the left hemisphere in most people the right hemisphere is the hemisphere where the orienting reflex first manifests itself and its job is to orient you where you don't know, where things that you don't know are happening. So it's also the place where imagination first takes root, because imagination is part of the process by which you make sense out of what you don't understand. That's where the hypotheses are generated. The right hemisphere tends to think in metaphor, and the left hemisphere is embedded in the metaphorical structure of the right hemisphere. And that's quite well documented in the relevant neuropsychological literature from a, from a multitude of sources, even from people who aren't concerned specifically with metaphor. The sense of meaning seems to manifest itself when the, 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 the systems that are operating in explored territory and the systems that are operating in unexplored territory are operating optimally together. So imagine that what you want to do to, to adapt property to, properly to life is to stay where you're adapted. Okay, so that's a conservative approach. Don't go where you don't know how to act. The problem with that is that things around you will change without your, without your control. So you, you can't just stay where you are. You have to be prepared for the next thing that's coming. And so not only do you have to master where you are, you have to master what's most likely to happen next. And so you have to have one foot in chaos or in order. And you have to have one foot in chaos. And the way you know that that's happening optimally is that you're imbued with a sense of meaning. Right. So it's actually the most profound part of what actually orients you in the real world. It's not a secondary epiphenomena. And, that, and the phenomenologists, the, the, the philosophical phenomenologists, actually caught on to this in, the phenomenological, in, their, in their phenomenological work. For, for someone like Heidegger, for example, meaning was the most real manifestation. And I actually think that's true neurophysiologically. That's how your brain operates. Your brain actually operates as if the most real thing is the meaning of something. 